Now, uh, I see uh, Sam's just around the corner. I need to let him in. I think he locked himself out with his key ring. Oh, you're going to go get that? Oh, I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, Sam sometimes gets himself into precarious situations. But part of a big part of tonight's show is going to be identifying, we're, we're going to give you some big picture ideas. We're going to talk about uh, less than specifics, but if you have specific questions about your dog or your dog training, let us know in the chat. But we're going to talk about some big picture ideas that can really make a difference when it comes to things like your dog's listening skills and your dog's trainability. And I was really, it, I don't know if I was surprised, I guess because I'd seen it, but Something that I learned very early on is great leadership choices uh, affect your training in a lot of different ways. Number one, your dog starts to make better choices. Uh, number two, they seem to be more motivated to listen. And number three, it's a lot easier to fix the little problems, often because they don't come up, but the little problems in your training if you don't make the mistake in the first place. So the first common mistake I want to talk, talk about tonight is uh, when, when a, a new dog owner is feeding everything mm -hmm. that their dog does. We use a lot of treats at the beginning of training, certainly during puppy training. We yeah. use food as a reward because it's a resource the do that your dog already finds valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, there's a point where you need to begin to wean off of the food. Maybe more importantly, there's mm -hmm. a timing issue that a lot of new dog owners encounter. They don't know they're making a mistake. They think like, oh, okay, you know, I use this food, I use this treat or this uh, your food reward in a certain way and my dog starts to learn it. Well, this all comes down to timing. But let's talk about someone who might be feeding everything and how it's going to slow down their growth, their, their dog's learning ability. Yeah, I think sometimes what we end up feeding, and we do want to feed a lot, like I do want to reiterate that. So if you have a, um, a young puppy that's just learning, we want to be reinforcing a lot because we're trying to mold and shape them to make, uh, to make good choices. Um, however, there is such thing as... Um, feeding too many things and uh, or feeding at the wrong time that can really mess things up because dogs view rewards as whatever they happen to be doing in that moment as a good thing so if we're just feeding everything sometimes it's hard for the dogs to um, get a true sense of what our expectations uh, for things are the other thing that I think sometimes people do is they end up rewarding things that aren't really reward worthy. So, um, you know, we end up rewarding our dogs and I see this happen a lot of times with new dog owners where they'll want the dog to sit and pay attention and call their name and the dog will kind of sit but then like do one of these and put right. their back to them and then the person will right, literally sure. reach around and yeah, give yeah. them a treat to yeah. reward them because yeah. in their mind they're like, well, the dog sat and in, in a dog trainer mind, it sat, but it's back to you. It's not looking at you. It's not engaged at you. And on top of that, it just got a reward. So you really want to think about what your dog's doing and what they're thinking about too as well. Um, when you're reinforcing something so that you're not ending up um, overusing the food or using it incorrectly. And then um, your worst nightmare happens and that is they become dependent on the food. And that's why a lot of people are so resistant to use the food, but the food, but you need to learn how to do it because if you do it correctly, you definitely won't rely on it and you can just accelerate your dog's learning so so quickly because we're getting good reinforcements in regularly um hold on to your hats because we're going to go a little bit deeper than you know we might normally discuss in our training videos um I, I, let, let us know if you guys are good with that kale mentioned something that's really important there and rewarding the dog in the right position um so you know, sometimes our train stations get a little bit deep, but know that we're going to give you some really a little deeper insight uh, into your training. Another important part of that is the timing. So uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, when the dog, you call it, call your dog to come inside or call your dog to, to whatever, response to name, recall, whatever mm -hmm. the skill is, and it's not working. What's your default? What's the next thing you do? For a lot of people, that mm -hmm. might be like, go get the cookie bag. You know, call, they call their dog in from yeah. outside to go get the cookie bag, shake the treats, or they, uh, you know, they reach into their bait pouch or their pocket, you know, to, to indicate to the dog because they mm -hmm. know that's going to get, that's probably going to get a result. And that is the worst thing that you can do for your dog's learning because who, your dog at that point is training you. Mm -hmm. I actually set aside a clip that talks a little bit about um, timing uh, from a video that we did a while ago and I think it'd be good for this for you guys mm -hmm. right now to maybe take a look I'm at curious. this. I'm curious my brain's like going right now because I'm thinking about a situation that happened in classes I actually got to teach a class today a puppy class which was really fun but I'll watch this I'm curious to, to see whether 
I'm predicting okay. what you're about to show. Well. And if not, you'll get two examples. Yeah, exactly. Another common mistake that people make is rewarding their dog with food, but in the wrong position. So for example, if I've asked Funky to sit or lie down and I go to give her a reward and just as I'm about to feed her, she ends up standing up. We have a lot of people that say, good, and they feed their dog anyways. And what starts to happen is the dog learns that when you say sit and you approach them, they're gonna stand up for the treat every single time. So keep in mind that now, Kale just mentioned that this was her example, which, uh, I mean... And not this, not the standing up part, but um, this exact same process. I'll explain after, yeah. but it's funny. It, it, it's so important that it bears repeating. I mean, this is yeah. a perfect example of students who really struggle. If you're struggling at home getting your dog to listen, you say like, oh, he only listens when I have food. This is exactly the mistake that you're making. So pay close attention. What you've asked your dog to do needs to be reinforced in that position to strengthen the skill. So if I want to teach Funky to sit, when I reward her, I'm going to feed her in a way that she still continues sitting. Yes, I might raise my hand above her nose a little bit more, keeping that weight in her bum so she doesn't pop up for the sit. Good girl, good sit. Same thing for the down. If people reward in the down, we have a lot of people that say yes, and they pull their food further away and the dog pops up out of position and we reward anyways. This can create a lot of confusion for the dog because they learn what I'm rewarded for, my mom or dad must like, and I'm gonna keep repeating that. So it's very important that I'm clear with my dog that if I've said yes and I'm gonna reward, my dog's still assuming that position as I go to actually deliver the food to them. So that was a little bit more about position rather than timing. Let's talk for a moment about timing. Um, and I'll, actually, let's talk a little bit about, you'll if you watch any of our YouTube videos, you'll see us using the word yes to mark the moment that the dog is correct. And what we do, and if you watch some of our like early puppy videos, you'll see us actually building value for that word. Let's talk a little bit about why we use yes in our training. Yeah, so we like to use the word yes because we need to make sure that we're delivering our information within good timing so that the dog actually comprehends what we like and what we're trying to reinforce because dogs uh, dogs are within one second. So if your dog does something correct or if they do something incorrect, we basically have to tell them right then and there. And when we use food in our training, a lot of people are like, well, how do I get the treat into the dog's mouth the second they do that thing? Um, and it's an easy answer. You don't. That's what the word yes is for. Or you could also use a clicker, for example. But we really like to use the word yes for a couple of reasons. We have no problems with clicker whatsoever. I use clicker for lots of different things. But initially with puppies, I really, really love to use the word yes. Um, I like it because I have the word yes on me all of the time because I can speak. I don't have to carry around a little prop everywhere. Yeah. The other thing I really love about yes, and if any of you guys who watch me in videos, you won't be surprised by me saying this, is I can change how I say the word yes to let the puppy know how pleased I am. So it could be like yes, or it could be like yes! Oh my God, that was so good. And I can go crazy. And then the puppies are like, whoa, I just did something really awesome. So I can tailor my voice a little bit. Now that's sort of a little bit about the word yes. That word yes needs to come out with good timing. So to give you an example of um, like walking at your side, for example, if your dog's walking at your side, things are going great. And all of a sudden your dog starts to creep to before, uh, ahead of you and they start to pull on the leash. And as they start to move ahead, you end up saying yes. And then you reward. If you repeat that a few times, you will accidentally train your dog to walk two feet ahead of you or learn to pull on the leash and then come back for a treat. Pull on the leash, come back for a treat because of when you're actually pinpointing that good behavior. So you want to think of the word yes as if you've taken a, you know, a picture, a snapshot. So if we're walking, for example, and this can be applied to anything, of course, but if the dog's at your side, they're um, holding good position, their leash is loose, maybe even if they're paying attention to you and you say yes at that moment, then you can follow through with the food from there. And what happens is over time, when you have had hundreds of thousands thousands of repetitions of your puppy and dog hearing the word yes and then giving a, re a physical reward after food, toy, praise, affection, whatever it might be, um, your dog will literally start to internally feel joyful when they hear the word yes. Yeah. And then what will happen is you don't actually need the food anymore. But the only way that this is going to work for you is if you use the word yes and the food properly. You're giving good timing and that way you won't become dependent on it down the road. The, um, the McCann method uh, is the method that we use to train dogs. It's sort of evolved over the past 40 years um, and, and you know, help 
well over 100,000 dog owners like in our building to, 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 to listen, to want to listen. The goal of the McCann Method, to motivate your dog to want to listen. Now, wouldn't it feel nice if you felt like your dog wanted to sit when you ask, wanted to come when they're called? There's a way that you can get there and it comes down to some of the steps that Kale's talking about, yeah. but that's the foundation of training. You want your dog to listen because, you know, uh, it feels good to them because you've set up tons of situations where you've given them no other option, but you've also allowed them to start to connect the idea that like when they work, do something for you and they work for you a little bit, they get rewarded. There's something of value in it because we're introducing them into a world that isn't really made for dogs. You know, we're introducing them into a human world where our expectation is you got to walk at my side, buddy. You can't go hunt mm -hmm. and forage across the <laughs> across the neighbor across that, the street. That concept valuable to That's a dog. That's right, right. So, so you know, imagine imagine your dog was excited about listening. That's that's the goal here, and that's what this timing does. I think um, busy with dogs. At this point, my, she likes to lay down after I say yes. And I have to watch myself so I don't give her a treat when she breaks the sit. Mm -hmm. Really common mistake. That's a very common mistake that, that a lot of people make is, again, feeding your dog out of position. But it's also why we introduce a release command. So mm -hmm. the expectation is that we tell our dog to do something, that they're going to do it until we say, okay, or we've released them out of it. And mm -hmm. the value there is it's very clear. Dogs are very uh, black and white in how they learn things. So if we let them know that when I ask you to do something, keep doing it, keep you know uh, committing to that behavior until I've said, you don't have to do it anymore. Now we're going to be fair about that. You know, we're not going to ask for a sit stay that's like 20 minutes long for mm -hmm. a dog in, that's learning. But we're, we do have ex an expectation once they've learned it that they'll remain doing it until you know we, we release them that's a valuable thing to even for a sit it doesn't matter what the skill is it's a valuable thing to remember the other big the next big mistake that a lot of people make comes down to poor management and this is so common mm -hmm. i would say uh, a, a large majority of the problems hey buddy large majority of the problems that people have when it comes to um we're, issue, ca we're cat it, training off, off it, camera here. Issues with, issues with their dog not coming in when they're called has a lot to do with management and not yes. having that dog on a leash or a line. Let's talk a little bit about some of the management issues that people encounter and how it can like totally change their training. Yeah, I think the recall is a really good example because a lot of the time, you know, we want to give our dogs an opportunity to blow off some steam or to go and have some fun. And then when we go to call our dogs and the dog sort of takes one look at you and says, nah, I don't really feel like it, um, and they don't listen, we have no leash, we have no control. And so the dog learns that, you know, recalls are optional, listening is optional. Or better yet, if your dog doesn't have a, a line or a leash attached to them, uh, even dragging behind them and say, for example, you do call your dog and your dog gets close and they see that you're about to hook their leash on or take them inside or put them in the car and they, they decide to run away. And again, you don't have a leash or line on, then you're there's you know, they are just allowed to make that choice. And oh. that sort of wrecks your recall training or it's also if it happens over and over and over again for um weeks at a time months at a time even it becomes even harder to fix because that becomes um sort of a fun keep keep away game so what we suggest that you do is when your dog is being given free time which means they're out of their crate or they're given a little bit more um space to to play or to to interact with you keep a leash or a line on them all the time you can even get really long lines like 20 30 feet long that they can drag around so if they decide to play the little catch me if you can game or they decide to you know beeline it the other direction when you want them to come towards you um you have a way to stop them and to follow through so that that rehearsal can't continue happening and unfortunately a lot of people let these bad habits they let them happen over and over and over again every day for months and months and months on end. And yeah. what they don't realize is dogs are learning yeah. all the time. Every single moment of the day, your dog is learning, they're computing, they're thinking about it. And if it's something that is that they find rewarding, like running and getting chased and chewing things in the backyard or whatever it might be, and there's no other option but to get to do those things, they will repeat it, and then it becomes much harder to fix down the road. Let me know in the chat, because this is so common. I know there's gonna be a bunch of examples out there. I'd be interested in seeing yours. Um, what's one thing, behavior, nuisance behavior, that your dog has learned because you haven't managed them well, because you've missed an opportunity? 
in, in an absence of information, your dog's gonna think that whatever feels good, maybe it's chewing on your shoe, maybe it's peeing in the corner, maybe it is whatever, whatever the thing is. If it feels good, the dog's gonna, your dog's gonna think that's right. So it's really important that we're managing them well so that anytime they're there to make the right choice or the wrong choice, that we're giving them great information. So I, I'd love to know in the chat, what's, what's something that your dog's learned because you missed, the, missed those moments. You, you've missed that opportunity to give them great information. Speaks a little bit to crate training and why we so wholly believe in crate training. In fact, when I first brought Deegan, my black Labrador retriever at two years old to McCann Dogs, she was an absolute wild thing. It <laughs> felt like there was no rules and I hadn't given her information in, to the contrary. One of the first things actually talking to Deb McCann, uh, one of the co-founders of McCann Dogs, she mentioned, you know, it, it's a good idea to introduce her to a crate at this point for a few reasons. Number one, Every time she comes out of the crate, you're there. You're doing something with her. You are the center of all things that are fun in this world. Mm -hmm. Number two, she and, and I had taken Deegan to the animal hospital a couple of times at this point because she had, you know, gone into the laundry basket and swallowed a sock. She'd eaten half of a tennis ball. You know, she'd uh, jumped up on the counter when uh, I was making, I forget, chocolate it's a cake or something. There's something chocolate. Wait, and, you can make chocolate cake and we've been married for how long? Yeah. Well, I was trying to make chocolate cake. Uh, <laughs> Deegan uh, interrupted that. Maybe it's like the memory I've got left over, the, the fear I had. <laughs> but uh, because I wasn't managing her and not uh, supervising her, she'd made all these wrong choices. And that when, that's, when that happens... Your dog learns that like, ooh, it's kind of fun to jump up, jump up on the counter because there's delicious cake batter up there. You know, it's kind of fun to chew on the shoes in the, in the uh, entryway because they're there and it feels good on my teeth. So when I started using a crate in my training, it was really an interesting pivotal moment for me because Deegan started to want to listen because every time she was out with me, I was training her. I was taking her for a walk. I was doing, I was, you know, playing tug with her. I was doing these things that engaged her with me. And she wasn't having the reinforcement of doing all the bad stuff, jumping up, barking at the window, whatever the thing is. So a crate is such a valuable tool. Also keeps your dog safe. Yep. Yeah, the crate is really valuable. And I, I think it's much more common for people to understand the value of crate training now than maybe back in the day. You know, we do so much training on teaching the dogs to like their crate. Um, and some dogs it comes very naturally to and some dogs it's a little bit harder. You know, we, we've had all, all types of dogs with crate training. Some have been just a piece of cake and some have been a little bit harder, but they all figure it out with good information. And in fact, some of the dogs, some of the puppies that I've had that were, you know, a little bit more challenging to crate train, literally as an old dog, love their crate to this day um, because it's about how you use it. So um, it is important because when they're in the crate, they are not rehearsing bad things. And what happens is when they're in the crate, they are not rehearsing bad things, but they're also not learning things. So right. you need to remember that when they're out of the crate, that time matters. That time matters. You need to be interacting with your dog, exercising your dog, training your dog, interacting with your dog, building the relationship, and then put them back in the crate and then take them back out, do some more training. And what will happen is when you have them out and you're doing more and more training, your dog is going to develop more and more skills. And those skills are going to blend perfectly with starting to reduce the use of the crate should you wish to do so. But people often do it the other way around. They let their dog have all this freedom and then they bonk their head against the wall trying to get the dog to, you know, not make poor choices, but they're not giving themselves a break. They're not allowing the dog to have a spot where they're just on pause for a second and not rehearsing poor things. So the crate isn't a, um, it's not necessarily something you have to use long term unless unless you want to. We certainly do because we travel so much. Um, our dogs are in a crate in the car. My dogs are in crates at dog shows. Yeah. My dogs are in crates when they have to go to the vet, all those things. Um, but it's important that you understand the management side of things because they can't be managed well if they are loose running around the house doing their own thing 24 hours a day. That's when you're going to have bad behaviors and it's harder to, to fix. I think one of the um, one of the uh, things that people struggle with a little bit is feeling crate guilt. Yes. And they say like, oh, I don't want to put my dog in a cage uh, for this reason or that reason. And there's two 
two pieces to respond to that. Number one, we're going to show you how to help your dog love the crate. It's going to be like their safe place. It's your room when you were a kid. You know, it's where you'd go and you'd feel relaxed and you'd know that it was your safe space. But number two, we have a million videos, maybe not a million. We have hundreds of videos on this YouTube channel that can help you to get that engagement with your dog, to burn off that excess energy so that when it's time to go in their crate, they can't wait to get in there so that they can lie down and have a sleep. They're feeling yep. satisfied and tired out and they're just ready to like come down a little bit. Um, it's so valuable. I wanted to take a step back. Some of the uh, poor management um, results, consequences, I think that a few people uh, have mentioned, Carrie mentions eating dandelions. Um, I see. They love to eat dandelions, pop the heads off. Yeah. Danielle says eating dog, eating dog poop went off leash. That's a great example. Uh, Sarah mentions leash pulling. That's a little bit more of a training. It's it, kind of the steps in your training more than a management thing. But um, we can talk a little bit about that. Wanda says counter surfing. That's exactly the examples that I give. Yeah, it, it, it's so common, especially yep. if you have a bigger dog, yep. like a taller dog that can kind of already see up there and says jumping. Okay, this is a good example. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Because so many people say something like, I don't know what to do when someone comes in my house. My dog jumps on them. I obviously don't have a leash on them. So what am I supposed to do about that? <laughs> this is exactly where a tool like a house line comes in or a leash nowadays. Let's talk just briefly about what uh, what you can do if you have a dog who's jumping up on you it, it, or on, on like your friends or family, someone in the yeah, house. Yeah, absolutely. I can even circle and, back to what we just said a second ago because you, you basically have two choices. You have uh, prevention and you have training. Those are your two options when somebody comes to your house. If it's like a quick thing and you don't want to deal with the dog, you don't want them rehearsing bad behavior, have your dog go in the crate while you deal with the person at the door and then they leave and then your dog's not rehearsing bad things. So that's prevention. That's easy. It doesn't necessarily solve your problem, but it certainly stops it from being a repetitive uh, reward of rehearsal, right? The second thing is training. So what do you want your dog to do when somebody comes to the house? Think about what that expectation is. For us, we have two things that we have our dogs do when people come to the door. Number one, sometimes if there's a bed or something nearby, our dogs will go and they're asked to lay on that place on that mat and they have to remain there. We also have um, an area in our house that has a couple steps down to where our, our sunroom door is and we've done some threshold training. So our dogs know they can wiggle their little butts at that person as much as they want to as long as they stay at the top of the steps. So they're not allowed to come down. So there's a bit of a threshold. Now, in order to teach them that, we had to practice first teaching the dog about the threshold training without any people coming to the door, teaching them to go and sit there, lie there, hold position. We worked on our sit stay, our down stay, all of that kind of stuff. And then we practiced with each other. I would have the dog practice the position. He would go outside, knock on the door and come in and we would flip flop and we would practice so the dog was learning. And then we would, you know, try when somebody would come to the door. So we're training the dog what to do. But circling back to the leash, if your dog is not on leash during the training process and they decide that they don't really care about the treats or care about what you have to say to them and they're more excited about the person and they scoot past you and jump on the person, well, now, now you're forced to have to deal with the situation. If you had a leash on, a second the dog breaks position and they go to jump on the person, you can stop them with the leash. You can reinforce them back into that position. You can follow through without letting your dog rehearse the bad behavior. But if you do not have a leash on, your timing's impacted, which we've already talked about how how essential that is. Mm -hmm. um, and also your consistency is interrupted because you can't follow through properly if you're chasing the dog around the house or you know trying to get the dog, pry the dog off the person. So the leash or the house line is absolutely a must in all kinds of situations, but very much so if it's dealing with, um, with jumping. Um, somebody mentioned in the chat, well, what do you do if the dog's chewing on the house line? And this is a really common yeah. problem. I mean, that's an, almost an expectation because you've just attached a fun little thing to the yeah. side of your dog that they might chew on. But this is where the supervision part of the management comes in. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be, anytime your dog has a leash or a line on, you're going to be observing them, supervising them. Um, you know, it's going to be your five foot arm extension, but it's also going to be ex the kind of thing you need to get your dog accustomed to. We have a couple of videos here on the channel that talk about what to do. So if your dog starts chewing on it, you're going to take it out of their mouth. You might even get them to do something. So you take it out of their mouth, ask them to say, 
interested and then give them something that you want them to chew. You know, you give them an opportunity to satiate that need for chewing, but you just show them this is the right thing. The leash, the line is the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's so important that you don't just let them chew and chew and chew and chew. That's why we're supervising them. It's a really important part of the yeah. uh, using a house line or a leash. For sure. Don't allow your dog off leash if you're not sure what the result's going to be. Um, we will be very careful about the situations where we will take our dogs off leash because you also need to be aware of what environment am I in and are there other dogs who are off leash in this situation. But you might have seen our recent series with Five Alive, our newest puppy in the household I I I from our home. And um, we... Blue. we we go through all kinds of steps to make sure that he's set up for success. You probably, maybe you followed some of them. The one thing we didn't do for a long, long time was take him off leash mm -hmm. in any real situation. If we were out somewhere and we needed, we wanted to take the dogs for a walker, I mean, the McCann uh, Professional Dog Trainers Training Facility is on beautiful 22 acres, so much room. We'd take the big dogs for a walk, all of the dogs that you know have great skills and whatever, and then we'd take five for his own little walk, so mm -hmm. there wasn't too much stimulation. But what we wouldn't do, even as five started to learn skills, is just let him run around with those other dogs because we want to reinforce the fact that we bring all the value in the world, yeah. that we're more interesting and exciting than it is to chase the other dogs. Mm -hmm. Someone had mentioned that, oh, my dog learned to eat poop when they're off leash. Well, this is exactly why you'd put the house line back on. Mm -hmm. If they knew the skill and you started to see, you know, it, it wasn't as successful, wasn't happening as quickly, put that leash or line back on and it gives you the power to train through some of this stuff. Yeah. That's where management is a such a handy tool, mm -hmm. the ebb and flow of dog training. Yeah, you really have to think about prevention because like I said earlier, the more they're repeating these bad behaviors and, and they're getting something rewarding out of it, even if it has nothing to do with you rewarding them yourself, it's just a, a natural re reward of rehearsal, then they do become a lot harder to fix. So you've got to you've got to think about being a good manager a manager and Or a uh, manager. Or a manager. Yeah. Um, and these are the types of things that we go into detail a lot about in our online classes. I spoke a lot about this in our Puppy Essentials class today um, because it just the most common thing is um, giving your dog um, too much opportunity, too much freedom to make poor choices. But I think sometimes what people struggle with, and people struggle with this with watching our YouTube videos sometimes because we do, um, you know, a small, our YouTube videos are Fantastic, absolutely. But they are a small peek into whatever the topic it is that we're talking about. And also because we're trying to um, display our information to a wide range of people, yeah. we do speak really generally. And so yeah. what ends up happening is people say, well, what if my dog's jumping? Well, what if my dog's pulling? Well, what if my dog's barking in the crate? Well, what if my dog's doing this? And the McCann method theory works on all of those things, but then we have to teach you sort of how, how to adapt it to each individual topic. And then sometimes for the dog. So that's what's so great about our um our actual training classes because when we get to work with you and the dog we can let you know exactly what you need for your puppy because every dog is just a little bit different and it sort of allows you to take all of the exercises and all the information and kind of understand how you should put it together yeah. in the right order how much time should be totally. spent on each of these things so it's a little bit easier to navigate so um we have classes in person so oh, we always forget to mention this but we are from canada yeah. we're from ontario canada um so so our in-person facility is here in um, Flamborough, Ontario. Actually, we had a lesson one, the first lesson for our life, sk life school students yeah, a couple of weeks ago. And the nicest lady came up to us and she said, um, I can't believe you guys are local. Uh, <laughs> I watched your YouTube videos. I just, I didn't know where you were from. And then someone mentioned that you're from Ontario. And so that's why I'm here. And she ended up living like 25 very minutes close, away. Very yeah, close. Very close. So funny. Yeah, which is cool. Anyway, so we are Canadian. Um, yeah. And we have a, a great. I know, eh? A, a, and we do have a great facility here, but we also do have online classes. I think somebody said, I'm from New Zealand. I wish you had a school in New Zealand. We have a bunch of students Tons from New Zealand. Tons of Australian, yeah. a lot of uh, Australians, a lot, a lots of people from New Zealand. Um, anyways, you 
you can train with us online. Our, our programs yep. um, online are the same as our in-person. And the best part about them is any instructor that you get to see in person, you also get to work with them online. We're yep. super interactive. We're super supportive. We literally hold your hand through the entire thing. Sometimes I feel like we should be like dog trainer slash therapist because That's having a so puppy true. is hard. Yeah, it is. And you need to know kind of what to do. So um, Dan's dropping a bunch of links in the chat there so you can check out those things. Um, lots of people asking about Euchre in the chat. Euchre oh, actually cool. lives with Kale's brother. Yeah. 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 Euchre lives with my brother. She is two and a half years old now. Yep. And um, she's she's doing great. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's a fun dog. Very cute. He, yeah. He loaned her to us for you. Yeah. So that you guys could, uh, you yeah. know, we could do some training videos and create some stuff. Yeah. And then uh, she went on to I do thing. have to say that she still absolutely loves me and i do love when i see her because she can like barely contain herself yes, yeah. it always feels really nice yeah understandable <laughs> she's very cute the third mistake that a lot of new dog owners make and it, this goes back a little bit and touches on the management idea but asking too many times mm -hmm. so it's really important you know we've talked about um you know our ex expectation is that your dog will respond the first time every single time, but it takes some steps to get there. And something that people, this is a mistake that I made. I'll never forget. I work, uh, I work as a firefighter full time as well. Um, and I was, I had a bunch of my crew over and we were putting a roof on a building, whatever, not a big deal what we're doing, but we're sitting there at lunch. And I said, I was so excited to show them how Deegan would go run in her crate. And uh, it would work. It worked all these other times. I would just ask her to go in her crate. She'd go in and we're all sitting around the, table at, at my house and uh i said kitty in your crate and she didn't do it well i'd change the environment as a dog trainer now i totally understand what went wrong but i asked her again and again and again and again to no avail she always does this she always that's does this. exactly that's right so i want you in my brain i thought well she knows this and I, that moment sticks with me because i'll hear someone say like oh he knows this at home or oh she knows how to do this well if it's not happening then they don't know how to do mm -hmm. it i want you to just eliminate that idea from your mind because if you can recognize that your dog doesn't know it or needs help in certain situations it's going to make you a better trainer for them and that's ultimately what we want shows like tonight to do make you a better trainer for your dog the same thing comes with asking your dog to sit three, four, five times. I mean, if you say it enough, if you just keep saying it, eventually you're going to be right. But that doesn't mean they're listening. And if I say sit, 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 no, sit, sit, sit. Dog sits. Do you think they really understand what that word means? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I need to shout out Mary H. Dropping the four, $4.40 uh, super sticker. Thank you, Mary. Also, we just had someone sign up for grade two. I Very think. cool. Awesome. Awesome. So um, keep that in mind when it comes to asking too many times. Now, what do you do? Let's talk about the steps for like getting um, getting into a situation where you're not asking too many times. Like in your head, what are good like mental cues, mental triggers for someone to not repeat the dog's name, to not repeat the command? Um, well, I think this kind of piggybacks with what we said um, on the last exercise, and that is being prepared ahead of time on how you're going to follow through whether you're and how you're going to help your dog so there's a couple different ways that you could do that if you want to if, if you really think that the dog needs more help and more uh, guidance then maybe you do have some treats on you and you ask them to do something and they don't get it so repeat that command and then one second later use a bit of food to lure them in position and then reward them assist them or maybe they've been doing it for a bit and you think well you know, I really think you probably have a better idea of what this is. You're just a bit distracted. Maybe I say sit, for example, and then I use the leash and place them into position. But what I don't want to do is keep repeating myself and then teaching the dog that they don't have to listen. But I am going to evaluate in that moment how I'm going to help the dog to, to do so. Yeah. But I need to be ready to follow through with something that's going to get the dog to listen. That could be food. That could be a toy. That could be the leash. Um, that could be changing the distractions, low, you know, getting further away from the distractions. There's all kinds of things that I can change before I give the command again. Um, actually, I can give you guys um, a bit of an example today. We had um, our little puppy play session um, in our puppy essentials class, um, in our in-person classes today. And uh, we were letting the puppy play a little bit um, 
and uh, we talked about a recall and we uh, let the puppies play and then when it was time to call the puppies back um, a lot of our students were because they're brand new to the program they were shocked that they wouldn't just stand at the outside edges and right. call their puppies right. and right. I said okay well how many of you think that your puppy would stop playing with those eight puppies and run to you on the first command and they were like ah, that would never happen never and I said okay well, then why would we stand here and call them? Yeah. And they were like, oh, I get it. So what did we do? How did we work through it? We quietly went. We All the puppies were wearing little house lines in the play session so we could separate them very easily. Each person separated their puppy. We all skirted away from one another. We got out some really high-value treats, and we worked a bit of response to name. But because the puppies were separated and the distraction was much lower, they listened so much better. We let them get their treats, and then we sent them to play. We did that like three or four times so the puppies learn okay I get to go have fun but then I need to reconnect with my human I need to reconnect with my with my person and um, that's how we set the dog up to be successful we had treats high value treats ready we had the house line we were ready to work through any problems that arose because we were just thinking like a dog trainer tell me what I know what my answer would is tell me what it feels like to get to work with a group of adorable fluffy puppies for an hour, hour and a half. Oh, it's the, and like it's like the easiest owners. thing ever. Oh, it's just like yeah. it's like feel good time. Sometimes when the person just like wants to listen, I'll just go and sit on the floor and then I'll just hold their puppy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> today I got you. I, I, I got you. today I got to hold a chihuahua for a long time. Yeah. It was she was so cute. Oh, so cute. I was like, this is the life. I it's know. just the best. This is the life. Yeah. For sure. Um so re- reinforcing sorry guys, we just had a moment there. Um uh, asking too many times, that's a big mistake that a lot of people make. So just be really, you have to really be self-aware when you're training your dog because, you know, and I understand, I get it. There's lots of stuff to feel overwhelmed by. There's a million different things that you should be doing. And, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. This is where getting professional help from a professional dog trainer makes a huge difference because they can say like, oh, that way is not good for you. Try this. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very helpful. And, but be really self-aware of the things you're asking of your dog, of how many times you're asking for a behavior. And know that if it's not happening regularly on the first command, then train it. Work on it so that it does happen mm-hmm. because it can happen on the first command. This is really important when it comes to things like your recall. I mean, I don't know how many people are uh, remember that I was talking just uh, in the last couple of days about the Fenton video. You remember Fenton? Fenton! Fenton! Yeah. We were talking about that. I think I was I with that was instructor. L- that Shannon. video made me die laughing yeah. the first time I saw it's it. It's the perfect. I mean, I literally don't know. go to YouTube. Let let me, not let, now. Yeah. Watch the rest of our show. But after this, go to YouTube and it's search Fenton. If, if, literally, if you just write Fenton, just Fenton, Fenton recall video or yeah. Fenton runs away. Yeah. It is hysterical. You don't want to have the experience that Fenton's no. owner had. So Fenton's owner was not pleased. No. So you want to <laughs> have a dog that responds the first time every single time. <laughs> Next thing that we need to talk about, and this speaks to the idea of <laughs> Fenton, is I'm surprised how, we haven't had any dogs named Fenton in class. Maybe people don't um, want to like there's foreshadow. A stigma there, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, the idea, that, so common. Uh, honestly, I think we all have probably done this, and maybe it's a little part. Sometimes it's intentional to see how, where you are in your training, but overfacing your dog with challenge will completely unwind all of the good work that you've put in you work your butt off to get Mm -hmm. results you've worked your butt off to like make great choices and then you put your dog in a situation where they're completely out of their uh i don't know what word it is not league uh in a situation where they Mm -hmm. can't win they're overfaced by all the challenges Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah they're out of their element and, and and they they will struggle the problem with this is that we're all in a rush to get to a goal. We're all in a rush to feel good as we're walking down the street and our dog's in at our side. Like, think about it. You're walking and the neighbors are like, hey, wow, what a well-behaved dog. We're all in a rush to get to that point. <laughs> the reality is it takes some hard work to get there. It takes some like baby steps. But if we were to take our dog who's starting to get it, out into that situation and our neighbors say, hey, what a nice dog. And that's enough for your dog to lunge out at the end of the leash because they want to go visit the people. So being aware of like taking these small steps and avoiding the uh, 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 the um, the mistake of overfacing your dog with challenges will really give your dog the sense that you're a great leader. Mm-hmm. On top of just like being successful, can we talk a little bit about like leadership and like knowing what your dog's capable of and what might overwhelm them in terms of overfacing? Yeah, I think I think it is important to know um, 
it's important to know kind of what your dog's temperament and personality is like so that you can set them up. Our, our whole idea of, of training in the McCann Method is to initially set our dogs up to be successful because what they learn first, they learn best. That's exactly what when I said if you're allowing your dog to, you know, have bad habits for you know, months and months and months and months, it's harder to fix it. I think somebody in the chat just asked if you can train an old dog. Yeah, yeah. you absolutely can. You can train an old dog for sure. But keep in mind, the longer a dog has rehearsed certain behaviors um, that you don't like, the harder they are to fix. Some can be fixable, depends on what it is. Um, but they, it's not that their brain turns off and they're not capable of learning anymore. It just means that now you've taken a dog, instead of taking a puppy that hasn't really figured out how to learn yet, and now you can teach them how that they should learn, you're taking an older dog that has an idea of how they're supposed to figure things out, and then sometimes you have to figure out how to unlock that from them. So yeah. it's a little bit harder. Yeah, it just takes a little bit of extra work. With that said, we've uh, we've uh, gotten dogs that were like, eight years old yeah uh batman how old was batman? batman was three when we got him yeah like there's the, we've we've gotten older dogs yeah. and you once you can figure again you go back to the puppy stages actually this would probably be a good video like the puppy exercises that you should be doing with an adult dog yeah or, or like with an adopted dog rescue dog something like that because you literally go back to the first days because you want mm -hmm. to give this dog a new opportunity you want to give this dog an opportunity to learn how to learn you want to give yep. this dog an opportunity to be right so that they feel like when they're with you the world is a wonderful yep. place that's ultimately what we're trying to create and then you can get them out more places mm -hmm. you can do more things with them um, yeah and i think that's one of the reasons why like when people are looking for things to do we often suggest like trick training yeah um not because you know, we care whether your dog can shake a paw or walk backwards up a staircase. That's cool if they can do that. But what we love about it is it teaches your dogs how to learn, how to problem solve, how to like working, how to be motivated to, to do things for you. Because if your dog starts to have that type of frame of mind, it's a lot easier to teach them to walk on a loose leash and to do some of the more serious things. Um, it, it's all sort of relative to, to one another. So it's important to take the time to do that. Um, question, uh, do you use name then command instead of just command if they're in an environment where the pup is struggling? I love this question because I think this goes right down to the dog training um, uh, aspect of things. Yeah, yeah, you certainly could use the name first. We often will use the name sort of as like a, like a courtesy to the dog. But what we don't do is like say like Ken 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 and then finally when he looks I ask him to come or I ask him to lie down or whatever it might be so it's sort of like a bit of a courtesy so I might say the name and then the command so Ken and then I would call him or Ken lie down or whatever the situation is um, to give the dog just you know a little bit more of a opportunity to respond because we're around a lot of distractions but I'm not going to change my criteria of my expectation of how they listen to me so yes you totally could do it if it's going to be helpful but just keep in mind that you want to have you know um you want to be aware that you're not still repeating things over and over and over again. Yeah, and you've identified a training opportunity. Like, I would take that dog in a situation where they're going to be successful and then use command, 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 command. So I'm really reinforcing what that word mm -hmm. means. It doesn't matter where we are. That word means the same thing all yeah. the time. Um, so that was a good answer uh, from Kale. From Loma. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. Loma asks, let me find it here. My dog keeps pushing her ball under the couch and thinks it's a great game. Do I make her leave it or put the ball away to stop this? We should talk <laughs> um, for a moment at some point after you answer this about, is it Hero with uh, the self-guided ball game? Hero and Purple, mm -hmm. both the same thing. Yeah, I mean, personal, this is a personal preference. Um, obviously, if you want to stop it, put the ball away seems like a pretty obvious choice to me. Um, but you also could you know, use an opportunity to work some training. This is a perfect, you know, natural distraction that yeah. is is before you that you could work on. So, um, you know, put your puppy, on, put your dog on the leash, maybe get some with the ball under the couch, get some treats and work on your leave it, lure your dog's attention away. Practice five or six times in a row until you can walk towards the couch, say leave it and your dog turns and without even treats or anything, they turn and respond to you. So you can take, um, take advantage of that. But what you don't wanna do is keep telling the dog to leave it 
move them away and then you know a couple minutes later the dog's staring and trying to get the thing under the couch again that's not good training that that just teaches your dog that your words don't matter because they just get to go back to what they're doing so this is sort of circles back to what i said before you have prevention and then you have training so yes you could prevent it from happening so that you don't have to worry about you know your dog learning bad things but you also could just train through it as well um you know making her leave it is a good option but make sure you're actually making her leave it. You're actually training her to leave it and you're not just turning into a, a broken record. So you could go either way with uh, with that issue of the ball under the couch. Um, and either way would be good. You just decide what, how much how much you want to put into it. Uh, Instructor Robbie mentioned uh, the three Ds uh, when it comes to mm-hmm. increasing challenge in dog training. Let's speak to that just for a moment. So when, mm-hmm. something that's actionable about be, being careful about overfacing your dog with challenges is when your dog's got it, when they're starting to get the behavior, then you can start to increase one of the three Ds. And the three Ds are distance, distraction, and duration. Mm -hmm. And you're only going to increase one of these at a time. Like I'm not going to be working on my response to name and, uh, you know, I'm going to try it from really far away in a brand new environment if it was working okay in the backyard or on the driveway or whatever. I'm going to increase maybe it's the distance. Maybe I'm really focused the same same distraction level. Now I'm like still on the driveway a little farther away and I'll increase Mm -hmm. the distance. Or um, for walking on leash, maybe it's the duration. Maybe I'm just going from light post to light post or driveway to driveway or whatever the thing is. But I'm just increasing that little bit of distance at a time or, or the amount of time that we're walking for. So, you know, that's a good actionable way to think like, okay, my dog's starting to get it. How am I going to make this harder without putting them in a situation where I'm overfacing them with challenge? Use the three Ds. We talk about that in a few of our videos. Um Oh, that's a nice comment. Where did that go? From James. That's fun. Mm-hmm. James says, you guys mean so nice. my training my golden doodle fun and relationship building. The neighbors recognize and in, uh, in comment about her behavior uh, progress. I respond that we both come a long way. So great point, that's James. Awesome. That's a great point. Kale mentioned that we're often therapists. We're not. <laughs> our expertise isn't as, it isn't as much about training dogs as it is training people to mm-hmm. train their dogs. Mm-hmm. So uh, excited to hear that from you. It's uh, so nice to hear. It's nice to be proud like that. It's nice yeah. to be able to, you know, one of the reasons why we do this is not really because we, you know, we like dogs and we want to work with dogs. We do it because we like the idea of dogs being a part of your family. Mm. We like the idea of dogs being able to actually do things with you. Yeah. You know, we don't, we certainly don't have dogs so that they can just hang outside in the backyard all day. We want them to be a part of our life. We want what life. We want to take them places. You know, I do all kinds of things with my dogs. I hike with them. I paddleboard with them. I travel with them. I do all kinds of things. And one of the reasons why I can do that is because they're really, really well behaved. And so it's nice when you have a dog that, you know, that listens and has good skills because you can take them places. You know, if you want to go down and like grab ice cream with your family, your dog can learn to come with you and like lie at the table and just be a well-behaved yeah. family member totally. that's where we came up with the term so that's that's really good that's literally the, the the reason why we do this is because we want your dog to be able to enjoy their life with you yeah for sure um you mentioned like the, the pride aspect. It's so true. I mean, whether it's going for a walk or it's the fact that I'm confident that when someone comes to the door, I can open the door without the dogs darting out. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not worried about friends popping by, uh, you know, randomly because I'm not worried about my dog, you know, uh, jumping up all over them. These are, yeah. this is why we do the training. We want like McCann method is all about like actionable skills, bringing the training to the real world because that's really what we want. We're, we're focused on like living a normal life, uh, you know, an exaggerated life with our dogs, which is really important. Expectations. I would say the majority of students or, or maybe you, new dog owners, aren't really sure what they should do when it comes to expectations. Mm-hmm. And one of the mistakes that I made when I was first training my dog was saying that, well, you know, she's a Labrador retriever. And I've heard that they don't really get any skills until they're like three or four years old. She's you know, going to be an adolescent for a long time. It was one of the worst things that I could have possibly done uh, <laughs> is, you know, put that label on her that she I should expect less. 
especially after seeing the dogs come through our training facility with these like incredible uh, dogs that were just like Deegan, maybe even more energetic. And people had set some expectations. And when I got into classes, instructor Robbie was actually my first um, uh, Life Skills One instructor. Hit and the she jackpot. Said, yeah, absolutely. Did I ever? And she showed me this is exactly what Deegan can do. And in a couple of lessons, I started to see it happen. And I thought, holy moly, I would have never thought holy she could do this. Holy moly. So, uh, you know, understand your expectations. Maybe you can uh, talk with the the uh, the three things that we talk about uh, when it comes to expectations. Yeah, so we, um, we often hear people say, and actually you touched on this a little bit naturally earlier, um, they know this. And, you know, expecting that your dog can do it in every place all the time, the first time, every time, sometimes that just doesn't happen. We often joke if we had a, you know, a quarter for any time somebody said, like, my dog does this at home, that's yeah. good, but it's not helpful. <laughs> it's not helpful if they only listen in one location or, you know, whatever. So you can't really say, like, they know this as an excuse, um, as an expectation. You need to be prepared and you need to know that dogs are situational. And in order for them to be able to know it everywhere – because they can, they absolutely can do that. You need to put the work in, in practicing, um, you know, take the show on the road, get to lots of different places, make sure that your dog learns in lots of new places. And sometimes what happens is if you're getting through like one, two, three, four, five, six steps of progressions at home or in your driveway, and then you go to the park and you still expect your dog to ace progression six, right doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Sometimes you yeah. got to go back to progression two and then work your way back up because you've changed some of the, the Ds. You've changed some of the, the distractions or, or whatever it might be. So um, they know this. this. Take that out of your mouth yeah. and think about um, how you can train things differently. Um, the breed, as Ken had just mentioned. Um, also family members. Um, you know, sometimes different family members can have different expectations um, and that can be challenging for your dog from your dog's perspective. If the rules are kind of wishy-washy and some person lets the dog do this or doesn't care, or doesn't even pay attention maybe, and another person's being a drill sergeant and trying hard to get the dog to listen, um, you know, it's like you're, you're working against one another in the family home and that can be really hard for the dog. Or the dog can become a situational learner, which means, you know, when they're with that particular person they're good as gold and then with when they're with the other person who doesn't make them toe the line they're you know total hooligan so um you know it's important that as a family uh, that you decide about what your expectations are going to be of the dog and then everybody needs to be prepared to follow through and help learn to train the dog so that the dog listens to everyone because dogs absolutely will size each individual person up oh, so um, true. In, in, individually. You know, when Ken and I first got together, he had his own dog and I had my own dogs, several dogs. And some of my younger dogs that were more heavily in training, they connected with Ken and they listened to him um, very, very quickly. But um, the one, my one dog who's now 16 years old, Funky Monkey, she did not listen to Ken and yep. it drove him crazy. Um, and it was just because she was already older by the time we got together. And she was basically like, who are you? Um, and so he had to follow through and I, you even took her to an obedience class remember yeah. this is this is a really good point yeah because, because she was like you're not my person i don't need yeah. to listen to you so what do you guys think i did as a dog mm -hmm. trainer who knows who can see this coming and, and knows what to expect from a dog who doesn't really have good listening skills what do you think the difference was when we'd go out for a walk and kale wasn't there i'd put funky on a long line i'd put funky on a leash because i didn't expect her to listen to me mm -hmm. it's not about what she knew it's about you know uh, what my expectation was of her she just mm -hmm. didn't, wasn't that interested in listening to me at that point it's funny now because she now she loves you now yeah, i mean well, it's a totally different story. Yeah. But at that point, I knew because I understand leadership in dog training, I think I, I like, uh, I, you know, I was, I was careful about using good management. I want to mention Nicole the Kiwis thing. Um, my high expectations of my pup is I've heard they are smart and highly trainable, but she's, a, she's so young. I wonder if I'm being unfair on having those expectations. The 10 week old miniature schnauzer. This is something That's that I think good comment. it's a great comment and, and a good question. Now, Something that we like to discuss, it's complicated if we were just like making a YouTube video for it or, you know, without seeing you and your dog, is that it's not about the age as much as it is what they understand and your abilities. This is where joining, uh, you know, uh, Kale for, a, for a weekly calls on uh, Puppy Essentials program. 
we can actually in interact and engage with you and know where you're, what skills you need to work on next. But there is a loose guideline of like what you can work on. And we have those videos here on the channel. There's something like puppy training schedule by age that you could start working on. Yeah. Again, it's not, you know, um, it's like if you went to a new country and you spoke English fluently, but we went to France. Let's visit our friend in Paris, France. If we went there, just because of how old we are, doesn't mean we can speak the language very mm -hmm. well. You know, we have to do those progressional steps and learn the foundations of yep. the language, and then we can start to speak it. Same thing applies with to same thing applies to you and your dog. So understanding the foundation of learning, using some of those day one puppy exercises so your dog starts to understand what does yes mean? You know, uh, what does my name mean? You know, what happens when they say my name? This is all uh, progressional stuff, but um, maintaining those expectations. I love the fact that you asked the question. I love the fact that you said, I have high expectations, but I'm not sure because the moment you question that, it makes you look a little bit deeper. It makes you watch a few more videos and you're like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get it. It makes you yeah. like seek out more help, uh, you know, maybe from a professional dog trainer. I love that uh, attitude. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about. I think majority of people have too low of expectations. 100%. And so they don't think that their dogs are even capable of of doing the things that they can do even at a young age but also sometimes people have too high of expectations and what I mean by that or maybe they have um maybe it's not that's not what I'm looking for but they don't realize that like puppies don't come already having a recall right, or already right. knowing how to walk on a loose leash or knowing how to not chew things in your house they put them into situations where the puppy just has not learned how to do that thing anymore and then the only thing they can do is fail yeah. so having realistic expectations we literally do a whole zoom call in our uh, puppy essentials and life skills uh, classes yeah. on realistic expectations so that you can kind of figure out like what's the right thing for your dog and at what time absolutely so knowing that um uh some of the most common mistakes that people make are feeding everything, you know, feeding indiscriminately. Know, understand the process of when to introduce food, how to wean off of food, and then when sometimes you're going to jackpot reward because your dog's giving you a great uh, effort, great results. Understanding the difference between when to feed and when not to feed is really important. Not managing your dog appropriately. Poor management is one of the big mistakes that most new dog owners make and it can, it is totally avoidable. You don't have to put yourself in a situation where your dog is failing over and over again, learning the bad stuff. Asking too many times. If you, your expectation, we just talked about that, uh, should be that your dog responds the first time every single time. So don't put yourself in a situation where you're sit, sit, hey, Rover, 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 come on, Rover, Rover, get out the treat bag, Rover, Rover. I mean, it's just not good dog training. It's also really frustrating and you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're frustrated with your dog. Set them up to be successful. Put, put your dogs in situations where you're managing them well, where you can get those results, where you're not asking too many times. And don't overface them with challenges. I'm not gonna bring a new puppy home, put them out in the backyard and then shout from the window, come on in buddy, it's time for dinner or whatever. I, and have any expectation you know, that the dog's like gonna come in. Hi, hi there. Come Come on in, therapy. <laughs> come on, come inside for dinner. Uh, it's because it's not fair to the dog. You're also not going to take your two-year-old golden retriever who has terrible leash skills out for a long walk, you know, uh, and, and have any expectation that they're not going to pull. It, they're going to pull unless you've trained them, unless you've given them the skills. Be careful not to overface your dog. Maintain those expectations. The, the biggest, the thing I learned when I went, it, my sat down for lesson one of life skills one, watched all these dogs do incredible things was, man, I have completely underestimated what my dog is capable of. I've wasted so much time. You don't know until not you know. Enjoying this, yeah, not enjoying this relationship with my dog. Mm -hmm. It changes everything. I spent, I spent so much money on like, on like all the collars and the things and the harness and the leash and the thing and the, it was just for nothing. When I, when I sat down, when I started to train her, when I started to see it work, when I started to see her look to me for information because I was giving her good mm -hmm. information, it changed my life. And that's why we do these mm -hmm. train stations. It's why we love hanging out with you guys on our Thursday nights. Hopefully it's why you're watching the channel. Uh, what, did you have something? No, I just wanted to make sure people knew that, uh, cause I think a lot of the people, I, I recognize a lot of names or a lot of people that um, watch the, the show bi-weekly. Um, there's no train station next 
week. Two, two, two weeks. Yeah, weeks Ka- from now. Oh, that's right. Because Kayla's at the World Championships. Yeah, Championship I will be Jordan. in the Netherlands competing with Beeline. Uh, but then we'll be back uh, for regular programming right after that. I just wanted to mention that for those people who will be looking for us and us not being here. But we'll be back. We have a very cool video showing up Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. Um, talks a lot. There's a lot of myths out there, a lot of dog myths. And we had a very special friend, uh, veterinarian, join us for an episode uh, on the YouTube channel. Make sure you check it out. There were some things. There are some things in that video that you're going to be like, "Oh, I, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that." I, I, we had this moment as it was being edited today, so it was very, very cool. Um, Thank you, Sue. Do That's you, so cute. Do you? Does your dog listen to music? Like, do you use music in your day to day to relax your dog? Maybe you're headed out. Maybe you're working on crate training. You play some music for your dog. Well, at the end of tonight's stream. When this stream stops, you're going to be directed over to the McCann Dogs Music Channel, where we have two 24-hour live streams. We have a rain rain a, a, at the cabin, which is like this nice, subtle, gentle rainstorm going on. And there's like uh, McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We have created music specifically for dogs to relax. We've worked with some digital content creators, some digital it composers. It works so well, It too. works so great. And we get so many great comments on it. But at the end of tonight's stream, you guys are going to be sent directly there. I'm excited for you to check it out. I want to thank you for joining us. But more importantly, with everything that we've been doing tonight, with all of the teaching, all of the training, all the chatting back and forth, the rest, my friends, that's up to you. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you going to train next? Happy training.